Dear Rock Engineering colleagues and Sanai members, one of Sanai's new initiatives is to capture a series of video lectures presented by our Sanai members and fellows who've made major contributions to the rock engineering fraternity. We are following the example set by the International Society for Rock Mechanics. Our first video lecture will be presented by Professor Neelan van Amerva. Most of you will know Neelan, but I will give you a brief introduction. Not only was Neelan a past president of Sanai, he was also a past president of the International Society for Rock Mechanics, the only South African to achieve this honor. Neelan was also president of the SIMM, and the Federation of International Duo Engineering Societies, amongst many other honours. He has also made major contributions to rock engineering education through his role as Professor Centennial Chair of Rock Engineering at WITS and also the head of the mining department at Tucky. Prior to this, Neelan was Program Manager at the CSIR Mining Technology and the group head of rock mechanics for Sassel. Neelan has published numerous papers, particularly in the field of coal rock mechanics, and a book entitled Rock Engineering for Underground Coal Mines. More recently, Neelan has taken an interest in risk in rock engineering design, which is the subject of this video lecture. This lecture is entitled Getting to Grips with Reality in Rock Engineering. Good morning, good afternoon uh, to everyone. Um, as William has said, my name is Nieland van der Berwe. Uh, I've been in rock engineering for approximately 40 years, uh, both in South Africa and uh, selected other countries. And during this time I worked in gold mining, asbestos, diamonds, platinum, uh, and I guess I spent most of the time on coal mining and also some iron ore mining in France. During my career, I've seen things that I understand in rock engineering. I've also seen many things that I did not understand, things that, that simply did not make sense. And uh, it, it, it took quite some time to figure out some of the, the things that simply did not match up with what you expect in theory. And I think a lot of truth lies in accepting that rock and rock properties are variable. Um, so I'm going to talk about getting a grip on reality in rock engineering. Uh, what we need to understand is that just about everything in life is variable, nothing is constant. You can talk about your mass, uh, you weigh 80, 85 kilograms or whatever. Um, if you had to measure that on a day-to-day -day basis, you will find quite a bit of variability. Uh, your body temperature is variable. Uh, the time it takes to travel to work, uh, you can call it 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, depending on where you live. But once again, uh, if you were to record that on a daily basis, you will observe quite a bit of variability. Why should rock be different? I'm showing an example here of a jointed rock mass. Now, don't worry about exactly what we're going to do at this stage. I just want to show a couple of slides to indicate to you the variability in rock. Here we're just looking at the single aspect, and that is the uh, orientation of joints. Uh, I've got some colored in yellow. Uh, they are approximately horizontal, and then the lighter ones are approximately vertical. Now, if we were to take them out and plot them separately, uh, you will see the um, horizontalish ones on the top picture and the verticalish ones on the bottom. And what you will see is that they actually vary quite a bit. Now, what we normally do in rock engineering, and I wish I could say what we used to do in rock engineering, is simply to calculate one average value for the horizontal ones and an average value for the um, vertical ones. Um, I'm talking, of course, about the, the orientation here and nothing else. Now, let me show you another example another rock mass. Here I'm showing you a second example of a rock mass and again I've indicated uh, the joint uh, orientations, uh, the, the joint slopes really, um, the more or less horizontal ones colored in yellow and the more or less vertical ones again uh, colored in, in grey. And again we take them out and plot them like we did with the previous example and again you see that the there is variability, uh, 
Um, and once again, I just uh, inserted red lines to show the average values. Now, again, what we would normally do is just use the average value in a calculation. Now, this can be anything. Uh, I'm really just using the, uh, the dip of, of these joints to, to make a point. Now, let's compare the two. On the left-hand side, we've got the first case, and uh, this uh, shows really more variability than the second case that we've got on the right-hand side. And from this, we see two important things. Firstly, um, rock properties are variable, and secondly, the variability is not always the same. It differs from area to area and from case to case. If we were to use every single data point that we showed in the previous slides, you can calculate a factor of safety for each one of those. And what will happen then is that you will end up with a distribution of your factor of safety. Um, normally, we would just use the average value. But uh, here I'm looking at uh, case number one, uh, and you can see the distribution there that it's actually quite wide on either side of the average value. Um, what I colored in red here is the area of the distribution where the factor of safety is less than one. Now immediately this gives us a grip on the probability of failure because the percentage of the number of cases, the number of individual ones that we've calculated, where the safety factor is less than one, uh, are the areas where failure can be expected. Now I'm looking at the second case, and again we've got the distribution. But as we saw previously, um, the distribution is not quite the same. This time, because we had more consistency in the dips of those joints, uh, we have a much narrower distribution. The average value of the factor of safety is exactly the same. But because the distributions are different, the probabilities of failure of these two cases will also be different. Here we show the two cases on, on the same slide. And as you can see, case number one, I colored the uh, probability of failure, the percentage of cases where the safety factor is less than one. I colored that in red and the other one in green. And let me make the point again that for those two cases, we've got identical average factors of safety, but the distributions are different and therefore the probability of failure of those two cases will also be different. What we can conclude at this stage is that a factor of safety based on an average value only is misleading. There actually is a distribution of factors of safety. Now that distribution is there whether we like it or not and whether we calculate it or not. It's always going to be the case. Some areas uh, in the distribution will have safety factors greater than the average value and the others will have uh, safety factors uh, substantially less than the average value. Now, this is fine in principle, but the question is, can we quantify it and can we use this in our practical design? The answer is yes, it can. Uh, I don't want to, to quote uh, President Barack Obama, but yes, we can. Um, there are a number of statistical procedures available to us, uh, and I'm, I'm just going to, to use one uh, in two different examples, and I'm going to use real numbers in those cases as well. Uh, we're going to use the Monte Carlo uh, type analysis. Uh, this was actually developed in the United States during the time in the Second World War when the atomic bomb uh, was developed. And those scientists had to deal with a great number of variables and to, to determine the outcome of variability of all those different ones, they needed a technique. And then they developed this technique and it was named Monte Carlo because the father of one of the scientists uh, was a very keen gambler. Let's just look at the basis of the Monte Carlo uh, type design and it, it, it's really uh, not very complicated. What you need to do is firstly to determine which variables play a role then uh, determine the characteristics of each of those variables, and I'm talking about the statistical characteristics. In other words, uh, 
uh, we need to understand the distribution of them. Um, and then you calculate the factor of safety. Um, you can start off by just using the average values to give you some sort of uh, ballpark idea of where you are. And then what you're going to do is at random pick values from the distributions of your input variables and for each one of those calculate the factor of safety. You then collect all the answers, put them in a single distribution and uh, see what you've got. So actually you end up not with a single number but with a distribution of outcomes. And those cases where the, the safety factor is less than 1.0, if you add all of them up and determine what percentage of the total they make out, that gives you your probability of failure. We end up then with a distribution of all possible outcomes. Uh, this is provided, of course, we, we do su a sufficient number of, of calculations. And the number of calculations uh, you, that you require, you, you pick up very quickly. It really depends on the variability. The more variable the input is, the more variable your output is going to be, and you're going to need to do more calculations. You're not going to do this by hand. There are statistical packages available commercially that are actually quite good at this, but you can also use Microsoft Excel quite easily. There are a few tricks to using Excel, and, and we will get to those as well. Now, what we end up with is this distribution of possible outcomes and the percentage of cases where the safety factors is less than 1.0 that gives us our probability of failure. It's actually quite simple. In this slide, uh, I'm just going to try to explain graphically uh, what, what I've been talking about uh, regarding the, 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 the process of calculating uh, the Monte Carlo output. What you see on the slide here, the small little uh, graphs, those are the input variables, and quite clearly uh, they all have different distributions. Now bear in mind that uh, there are different types of distributions. I don't want to get uh, too deeply involved in statistics at this point in time, but your distributions do not have to be normal distributions uh, to use Monte Carlo. It, it can really be anything, log normal, beta distribution, it, it really doesn't matter. Now what we're going to do uh, is at random select data points from each of those distributions and calculate the safety factor. Uh, we do it a couple of thousand times. We uh, then create a distribution of the outcomes uh, that looks like uh, something on the picture on the bottom right uh, of the slide. Let's move on to uh, a simple example, and this is where we want to uh, calculate uh, the probability of failure of a roof support system. And I'm going to use the simple example uh, of a suspension roof support uh, system. You can see the slide there. Uh, we've got a, an immediate roof layer that has collapsed already in the area where the person was standing that uh, took the picture. And you can see the bottom layer that is weak. Uh, in this extreme case, it's already bending. It doesn't normally happen like that. I just use this uh, as illustration. If we now uh, transform the picture in the previous slide uh, to something a little bit more technical. Uh, we can see the roof bolts that uh, will be used for support. We've got our weak layer and the trick is that we need to suspend the weak layer onto the stronger layer that is uh, over, overlying it. Now what are the variables that we need to, to deal with? Firstly, and very importantly, there's the thickness of the weak layer. Um, the whole uh, length that we're going to use, the length of bolt that we're going to use, that's a variable. The whole diameter is variable. And please bear in mind that uh, we, we think if you use a drill bit, a standard 28 millimeter drill bit, you're going to get 29 or 30 millimeter diameter holes. That is not at all the case. Uh, it, it actually is variable. Then there's the shear strength of the resin rock interface, uh, extremely important. The spacing of our bolts um, and of course the width of the roadway that we need to support.
The calculation procedure, the first step is probably the most important one and this is to gather data. Uh, but whichever way you're going to approach this problem, you're going to have to gather data in any event, so just do it. Uh, determine your distributions, and at this stage, don't just calculate an average, keep your raw data. Um, we still need to understand the safety factor, so we need to write that equation. And then we go ahead, we calculate our couple of thousand uh, safety factors, determine the distribution, and look at the percentage below the norm that we've set. It can be 1, it can be 1.2. Normally, if we get it right, the uh, a safety factor of 1 is, is a, a good uh, discriminator between stability and instability. We need to uh, develop an algorithm for the safety factor of our um, support system. And there we, uh, we need to look at the upper end of the holes that we've drilled for bolt insertion. Um, and the diameter of the hole is important. The length of the anchor zone is important. And let me tell you, the anchor zone is the portion of the bolt that is in the thick, strong layer overlying our, our weak layer. You don't include the, the portion of the bolt in the weak layer in this at all. It, it plays no role in, in this type of support. And then on the uh, right there, you can, you can see the development of a safety factor. It's actually quite simple. You calculate the uh, resistance that your system is going to offer. You calculate the load imposed on it. The ratio between the two is a safety factor. That, that's always the case. Um, at the bottom, I uh, just transformed the equation a bit, uh, and again, without going into the, uh, the very fine detail of statistics, you just need to remember this, that if you are going to use Excel for your calculations, then each variable can only appear once in your equation. So sometimes you, you need to do a bit of transformation. There are ways of doing it uh, with uh, more than one um, appearance of the variable in the equation, but it, it becomes a bit tedious. Um, so those are the variables. I circled them in red uh, in, in this little equation. Um, and then you, um, you just go ahead and do the calculation. In this slide, I just show the input to indicate to you that the numbers that I'm using are really not outlandish. Uh, we've got our hole length or bolt length of 1.55 meters with a standard deviation of 0 0.1. Nothing strange about that. The mean thickness of our weak layer is 1 meter and we've got a standard deviation of 0 0.2. Hole diameter, 28 millimeter hole with a half a millimeter standard deviation. Shear strength of resin rock contact plane, uh, 2100 kPa with a standard deviation of 450. That standard deviation is maybe a little bit on the low side. Sometimes you actually get quite a bit more variability in that, but let's just leave it like that for, for the sake of argument. Uh, we've got a mean row spacing of 1.8, standard deviation of 0 0.3. And this is actually quite good. Uh, in practice, the variability is sometimes a little bit more than this. Um, road width 6.6 .6 meters with a standard deviation of 1.1. The guys sometimes cut offline and they've got to come back and to straighten out the roadway they have to take a bit off the side of one of the pillars and your roadway is a little bit wider. Um, the number of bolts per row, we can keep that constant. That's four. No matter where they are, we use four bolts in a row. There we've got our familiar distribution of the weak layer thickness. We've got the hole diameter distribution, the resin shear strength, the row spacing, and there comes the distribution of our safety factors. Uh, the blue bars are the safety factors greater than one, the red ones less than one. Uh, now, here comes the, uh, the surprising bit, and as I told you, uh, as I showed you, I did not use outlandish numbers for this. The average factor of safety is 1.4, and most of the time we would feel very comfortable with that, but our failure probability is actually 32%. Now this helps us understand uh, 
why we can do everything right in our roof support design using average numbers we've got a safety factor of 1.4 we should have stability but we have a 32 percent probability of failure um, i need to put this into context this does not mean that 32 percent uh, of the area that we've supported uh, as shown uh, is going to collapse th th that's really not the case if the failed bolts, if we can call them that, uh, if they are evenly distributed throughout the area, we should probably be okay. But if you've got two or three of those next to each other, that is where you are going to get your collapse. It's going to happen. Let us change just one input parameter. And I'm not going to, to mess at all with the average values. I'm just going to change the standard deviation of the weak layer. Instead of 0.2, we're now going to use 0.02. And this is what happens. Our average factor of safety is still the same. It's still 1.4 because the average numbers didn't change. The distribution, however, is much narrower. And all of a sudden, we are looking at a failure probability of 1.3%. Uh, I think this already shows how powerful this procedure can be and how misleading it can be to look at an average value only. If we compare the, the two cases, uh, just for clarity again, uh, on the left-hand side, uh, standard deviation of the weak layer, 0 0.2, on the right-hand side, 0 0.02, and our probability of failure practically disappears. Now, the question, of course, arises, how do we control that? Uh, because the thickness of the weak layer is a given. Uh, there's nothing that we, we can do about that, but in fact there is. This is a, a plan um, of, a, of a coal mine. Uh, for the mine as a whole, the average thickness of the weak layer is 1.0 meters. And the standard deviation is 0 0.2. So if you had to do one design for the total mine, that is the uncertainty that you're going to have to live with. But what we can do is to split the mine up into smaller districts and in the smaller areas the variability is going to be less and then we can start to handle it. Um, so here we can see that the average thickness of the weak layer is going to vary between 0 0.8 and 1.3 but because the areas are smaller the variability is less and the standard deviations of the thickness of the weak layer is actually going to decrease dramatically. Of course, this requires a bit more work. It requires going underground a few times more. But after all, uh, this, this is why we, we are in the mining industry. This is our contribution. I'm going to show another example. Uh, again, we're looking at roof support, but you can use the technique for anything, for pillar design, uh, what, whatever your need is. Uh, this is a slightly different application though, and I'm going to use this just to, to indicate how powerful this, this procedure can be. Uh, you're looking at uh, an iron ore mine with an obviously uh, badly jointed roof, uh, people walking <laughs> through underneath it. Uh, this was not in South Africa, this was in France, so we could do it. Um, and don't worry too much about the apparent instability. It's been like that for, for close on to 100 years. What I mean by beam reinforcement uh, is, is really that uh, this is a technique that we can use where the roof itself consists of rather strong rock, but it's heavily jointed. And we need to stabilize the, the joints. Uh, and we're also going to use this uh, type of philosophy where the joint spacing is much less than the, the road width. So the trick is to install bolts to intersect the joints. And if a, a joint is successfully intersected, we can regard it as, as having been stabilized. The ideal, of course, is to treat each and every joint that we see individually in terms of spacing, inclination of the bolt, etc. But in, in a real production setup, of course, we know that we, we can't do that. So what we really want to do is to develop a standard pattern for roof support that will intersect the maximum number of joints. Now, how do we do that? This is a cross-section, a little Mickey Mouse uh, illustration, really, of our road uh, showing the joints in blue. Uh, on top of it. Now what we're going to do, uh, we install bolts. 
and just for the, the sake of, of uh, illustration here, the joints that are intersected by bolts are now colored in green, the others are in red. The ones in red are, are really not intersected by bolts and therefore they have not been stabilized. So in this example, uh, half the joints are stabilized, the other half not, so we can say that we've got the system efficiency of 50%. How can we improve on that? There are a number of ways we can do it. The one is to decrease the bolt spacing. In other words, uh, we install more bolts. And again, in this example, we can now push up the system efficiency to 63%, uh, which means that we have a probability of failure of 27%. The other alternative is to keep the spacing the same, but just to make the bolts longer. And here we can push the efficiency in this example up to 88% by doing that. Or, depending on the orientation of the joints, we can also install inclined roof bolts. Now I know you're going to say immediately that you can't do this. Um, I can remember being underground in a mine where we spoke about the possibility of inclining the bolts and people pointed out to me that it was impossible and I then asked them to show me one bolt that was installed vertically. Uh, so bolts tend to be inclined by themselves. We, we, we can't possibly systemize that, but uh, this, this is not really necessary. It's just a point I wanted to make that the inclination of the bolt is also very important. So for this type of situation, the probability of failure is determined by the joint spacing, the joint orientation, inclination of the joints, length of the bolts, the spacing of the bolts, and then also the uh, bolt anchor strength. The support success depends on two types of factors, the uncontrollable factors and the controllable ones. The ones that we cannot control are the rock strength, the jointing configuration, uh, and of course the, the thickness of the bedding. But there are a lot of things that we can control. The length of the bolts, the spacing of the bolts, the inclination of the bolts, anchor resistance, the width of our roadway, and the extent of our uh, geophysical district, as, as we saw uh, previously with that coal mining example. The smaller we make the area, uh, the more consistent the properties are going to be. In this slide we are just looking at the effect of spacing, length and inclination again. Uh, so there we've got our bolt, uh, our joint uh, shown in blue and the bolts in red. And as you can see in this particular case, all of the bolts are ineffective. Uh, there are two bolts that uh, actually do penetrate the joints, but the depth of penetration is, is insufficient. So you, you don't just want to penetrate the bolt, there, there's got to be a certain minimum length of the bolt that goes through the joint. If we increase the length of the bolts, uh, then you can see that we've got one uh, colored in green, and because the bolt is longer, obviously the depth of penetration is greater, and, and we can uh, probably then uh, call that an effective bolt. And as we've said previously, the other alternative uh, is just to change the inclination of the bolts. If you don't like inclined bolts, that's fine, just ignore this option. Uh, there are other options available as well. Now, this is where it becomes interesting. Uh, because of all the constraints we've got, for any particular joint, there is a range where the bolt has got to be installed in order to be effective. Let, let's call that the effective range. And now, depending on the inclination and position of the joint, and the length, inclination, and position of our bolts, we can write an equation uh, for that uh, range uh, of efficiency that we want our bolt to be in. Now we can do uh, a little bit of an analysis, uh, bearing in mind that we're not really uh, trying to stabilize joints, we are trying to stabilize the blocks of rock between the joints. And, and uh, in order to do that, we just look at the individual joints. If we can stabilize them, then by definition, the blocks will be stabilized as well. There are really uh, just two fundamental forces at play here. One is the weight of the bolt,
Uh, and the other force is the inherent uh, horizontal stress uh, active in the Earth. And the equation that uh, I'm showing at the bottom of the slide there uh, is really just the requirement uh, for the angle of friction or the, the friction coefficient on the joint planes in order to achieve stability. And as you can see, this really is just a function of the inclinations of the two joints that define the block that we've got in between. The uh, reason I'm doing this is, is just to get some sort of a ballpark feel uh, for what measure of inherent stability we've got underground and, and to what extent we need to artificially stabilize those joints. Here we are looking at the uh, influence of the depth uh, why is the depth important? The depth is important because that uh, gives us a measure of the horizontal stress. And as you can see, it's, it's a rather re surprising result. Uh, at a one meter depth, uh, we've got a certain requirement for the uh, coefficient of friction. We go to five meters, you know, obviously it changes. But then if we go to 100 and even 2000 meters, it doesn't really change very much. Um, so at our practical mining depths, uh, generally in excess of 30 to, to 50 meters for underground workings, um, the depth really does not uh, play a major role. We have different uh, configurations of joints. If they are parallel, then the single blocks can, can simply slide out. Now, the required friction coefficient on those joint planes to achieve stability uh, depends obviously on the inclination of the joints. Um, let's, let's call it uh, 0 0.6. If you know absolutely nothing about the coefficient of friction of your joint planes, um, you can use a value of 0 0.6 and you probably will not be too far out. Now everything on top of the red dotted line uh, indicates areas where we need a higher coefficient of friction than 0 0.6. So that gives us an indication of the area of instability. And as we can see here, as long as our joints are really uh, parallel, uh, the, the problem is not quite that serious. At the other end of that scale, if the joints are dipping towards each other, uh, then, of course, we've got a very serious uh, situation. Uh, these are the wedges uh, and, and just the reality check. Uh, again, looking at our required friction coefficient and bearing in mind that everything above the value of 0 0.6 can be regarded as unstable, uh, the bulk of those are unstable. The, the only stable situation we've got is that we've got a wedge formed by 90 degree uh, joints. And of course, that's not really a wedge at all. Uh, but there we can have uh, tolerate the joint spacing of between 8 and 10 meters and it, it will still be um, stable. Uh, for the rest, the, the bulk of this area can be regarded as extremely dangerous. Now we already know that you, you don't need to do fancy calculations to figure this one out. It's just a reality check on the calculation procedure. Now we're looking at uh, a very realistic uh, situation, unfortunately a very, fairly common one where we have one joint that is approximately vertical, and then we've got another one uh, dipping towards it. Um, and as we can see here, the uh, requirement again uh, of the friction coefficient, um, we've actually got a very dangerous situation. Uh, for a 60 degree uh, joint dip, and we're now talking about the second one, one's vertical, the other one dips at 60 degrees, uh, once the spacing hits about four meters, uh, we are looking at a situation of instability. And why I say this is very dangerous is because the, the greater the spacing between the joints, the more dangerous it's going to be because the larger the blocks that fall out are going to be. With the uh, knowledge that we have now, uh, it, it is even possible to uh, just get the firm grip on the risk that we are looking at uh, by looking at the critical joint inclination and uh, in this case it, it's 73 degrees uh, we reduce the coefficient of friction to 0 0.5 and then you can see the bottom left quadrant uh, 
uh, indicates the area of stability for this type of situation. Now we haven't yet installed any bolts. Uh, this is just the inherent stability area that we, we are looking at. And everything beyond the, uh, the little quadrant that I uh, colored in slightly there uh, would uh, require support. All right, now I'm going to get real. You know, so far we've, we've just been looking at, at, at various configurations of joint, etc., to identify the, uh, the really dangerous situations. Uh, this is real data from a real mine, um, where we looked at the, the joints in the roof, and this is the distribution of the joint inclinations. Uh, that you can see here, quite a nice beta distribution. Remember that I said previously, your distributions don't have to be normal distributions. This happens to be a beta distribution. Uh, we're looking then at the joint spacing, and in this particular case, it also turned out to be a beta distribution. Uh, some of the other cases that I've been looking at, the, the spacing, uh, the joint spacing uh, was was perhaps more of a negative exponential distribution, uh, but this one was, was actually quite well defined. Now, uh, we can again uh, define our, our areas uh, of weakness by looking at the uh, cumulative distributions of the joint spacing and inclinations, and here we can see that uh, it will not be stable if the spacing exceeds 5 meters and the inclination of the joints uh, is, is less than 73 degrees, and statistically that will give us a 5% probability of failure. This is without the installation of support. To repeat the methodology that we are going to use, uh, we now generate, uh, let's say 40,000, 50,000, as many as you want, uh, joints uh, corresponding to the uh, mean and uh, standard deviation of the spacing and the derp. We record the daylight position of each joint. Uh, we calculate the beginning and the end of range. And remember, we define the range as that zone uh, where a bolt has to be installed to stabilize a joint. Uh, we calculate that because we've written the equation for it. Uh, then we generate a random bolt set corresponding to the mean and standard deviation uh, of the spacing and dip of the bolts. And again, if you don't like inclined bolts, the dip is just 90 degrees and the job's done. And then for each joint uh, in the set that we've now calculated, 40,000 cases, whatever, uh, we count the number of joints with a bolt inside the range. Calculate the percentage of the total that we've done and then you can start playing around because the, by the time you've calculated your percentage uh, joints that have been supported successfully, um, you will now know whether you're in the right ballpark or not. And now you can start playing around by changing the uh, length of the bolts, changing the spacing, etc., etc. Uh, I really don't want to get into the, the detail of this. Uh, I just really want to indicate to you that you can in fact do this uh, in a fairly simple fashion in Excel. Uh, what you really need to do is just to understand the, the, the inverse functions in Excel. Once you've defined the distribution, you then get your random uh, numbers from the distributions, do the calculations, and it's done. It, it looks more intimidating than it is, but what you really do is, is just to write the equation once and then systematically Instead of having constants in your equation, uh, you, you just insert the um, random uh, numbers that you get from your distributions. And now you can have uh, as many sets of output data as you want. You see, once you've created your spreadsheet, then changing numbers is a matter of seconds. And maybe it takes 10, 15 seconds to run, depending on the speed of your computer. But once you've done the initial job, maybe that takes you half a day uh, to change and to get different types of scenario after that is, is really a matter of seconds. Now you can, you can summarize uh, the, the output that you obtained um, for different bolt lengths and bolt spacings. Um, you, you can calculate your uh, percentage of joints that have been stabilized. Um, and let's say that you want a probability of joints being supported of 
then you look at your different combinations of uh, bolt spacing and bolt length. Um, let's look at the uh, column for vertical bolts only because that is what mo most people are going to install. Um, and then you calculate the cost of your different configurations. In the top half of the table, we're looking at 2 meter bolts. Uh, the bottom one, we're looking at 1.8 meter bolts. And the, really, then what we do is just select the cheapest option that will still result in 95% of the bolts being supported. Or if you don't like 95%, you can go 98, 99. Uh, it it uh, really depends on how you want to approach the risk. And, and we will uh, share a few thoughts on that uh, in a minute as well. At this stage, I think we can, we can already make a comparison between the deterministic and our probabilistic design methods. Um, we need to collect data for both. You're going to go underground and measure things in any event. Instead of measuring 10, measure maybe 20, uh, so that you can get a reliable uh, distribution for your input. You have to understand the mechanism. Uh, trying to do a probabilistic design if you don't understand the mechanism is really uh, wasting your time. So for both of those, you need to understand in what mode the roof is likely to fail, or the pillars, whatever, you can use this for anything. You calculate averages for both of the cases. Now, you determine a distribution of outcomes only for the probabilistic design method. You calculate the safety factor. Uh, for the deterministic method, you're only going to do it once. For the probabilistic uh, route, though, uh, you're going to do it many times, or Excel or whatever software you're using is going to do it a couple of thousand times for you. The output of your deterministic uh, method is a single number, where you get the distribution with your probabilistic view. Probability of failure from a deterministic method, you cannot get it. You end up with a number, but you don't know what the probability is that your design is going to be stable. Um, you don't have a quantified risk with your factor of safety because you don't know the probability of failure. Whereas with your probabilistic method, you actually do have it. Um, the output from your deterministic calculation um, I say it is not a realistic output because it's a number. That's all it is. It doesn't give you a handle to work with. And with the probabilistic method of uh, design, you make use of all the data which you don't do with your deterministic uh, method. Now, of course, uh, we come to the crunch. Uh, this is the question. What failure probability is acceptable. Now, this is an issue that, that needs to be debated and all the stakeholders have to participate in this discussion. Uh, here's just a proposal, uh, something to start talking about. Um, if we've got a class one situation, a short-term requirement, uh, personnel access uh, is partially restricted, then we can probably live with a 95% probability of stability. Uh, if we go to a more serious case, uh, a medium-term requirement, let's say we need stability for a period of one to five years, partial restriction of uh, personnel, maybe that should go up to 99%. And if it's very serious, like the main development of your mind, a long-term requirement, certainly in excess of five years, no personnel access restrictions, anybody can walk around there freely, um, there we probably need a probability of stability in excess of 99.7%. We should not confuse the probability of failure with the probability of injury or damage. Um, the probability of getting injured in a fall of roof, I'm going to show an extremely simple example is the probability that the roof is going to collapse, that's the probability of failure, and the probability of being right at that spot at the wrong time. Now, uh, this of course is, is a much more complex situation uh, than I'm showing here, but I'm trying to make a point uh, using statistics for this. If you look at a uh, coal mine section with an area of, let's say, uh, 300 square meters, 
uh, you've got the probability of failure of your roof support of 5%. You've got 12 people in the section. And the bolting configuration is such that you've got four meters for uh, four square meters uh, per bolt. Then the probability of a person being under any given bolt, and again, please, this is on the simplified assumption that people move around in this section randomly, uh, is 4 times 12 over 300, that is 0 0.16. The probability of being hit is the probability of the roof falling and the probability of being there at the right time. Uh, that means a multiplication of probabilities. It's 0.16 times 0 0.05, uh, which is 0.8%. So a 5% probability of failure of your support system does not imply a 5% probability of injury. It, it's uh, certainly much less than that. Uh, there are a number of key issues that are still uh, in the unknown that, that need to be sorted out before we can implement probabilistic design as a standard procedure. Uh, first of all, what is the acceptable probability of a fatal accident? Uh, in Canada, uh, it's anything between 1 in 10,000 uh, and, and 1 in 4,000. Now, this is not something that a rock engineer can recommend or a mine manager or whoever, mine owner. This is where a lot of people have to get together, all the stakeholders, and agree on acceptable norms. Now, what we have to understand is that those probabilities of failure are already there. They already exist. We're not going to create them. All we're going to do is expose them. But we need to know is to what level of certainty, what probability of survival do we have to work to that is going to be acceptable to all the parties concerned. And I know the first reaction is to say there must be a zero probability of failure. Um, let, let's, let's be realistic, that is simply not possible. It can never be zero. Uh, I know many companies work towards a, a zero uh, harm uh, method of work. Uh, it's a lovely ideal. We have to strive to that. But in practice, no probability of anything going wrong can ever be zero. It simply does not exist. And then once we figured out the uh, required probability uh, of stability, then we can get to the probability of a roof collapse or a pillar collapse. Uh, we need to know where we are at the moment. Uh, that, that is actually a very important benchmark. And this, this we can calculate, this we, this we can figure out in a very short period of time. And once we know that, we know where we want to work to, and then we can actually get going on it. Um, there will be practical constraints, uh, equipment constraints, operator expertise, uh, etc., etc. And obviously all of those things have to be taken into account. The bottom line is that rock is real. Rock is not just a mathematical thing out there that always conforms to a given average, whatever we want to talk about. Rock is real and I think it's time that as rock engineers, we should also start getting real and take into account the impact of variability and work towards probabilities of survival. Thank you very much for listening.